parts of the world. Uh, we welcome you to Weed Women Eco Artist Dialogue Art Plus Activism number 15 to spotlight the work of Weed Seed member Linda Wine. Weed Founded in 1996 is a volunteer run collective of female identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. As I mentioned, I am Kaylin, Weed Board member, and our other Weed Team host is Mary White here. Right. Uh, we'll start with a land acknowledgement. And if you wish, we'd like it if you type in your location and land acknowledgement in the chat. Um, the Weeds Office sits on the territory of the Weechen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ch Chichonio speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. You're one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area, just a few blocks away. This land was and continues to be a great importance to the Muima. Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona band. We recognize the Muima Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the Association of Ramaytu Ohlone who are researching, revitalizing, and preserving Ramaytu Ohlone history and culture, and the Confederated Villages of Lejeune and the Sakorate Land Trust, which is returning native lands back to indigenous stewardship. And a little Zoom housekeeping. We are recording this presentation as mentioned. So please keep your audio muted in the presentation. And um, the host may mute you if there is extra noise. If you have questions during the presentation, you can put them in the chat for the question section. But I believe also Linda's open to having this be more um, dialogue driven. So um, I'm not sure if Linda would like to say a word about that as we begin. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and we'll stop the first recording potentially and start another one immediately uh, later if we go past the hour mark. So just be aware if we start and stop again, that that's what we're doing. Um, and so I can turn this back over to Mary to introduce Linda. So we are delighted that we to have art and education number 12 and the presentation demo eco M O. Demonstrating Ecological Modes of Operation with our seed weed member, Linda Weintraub. And uh, Linda's asked me to make it relatively short, but I thought we'd list in the uh, chat her books. She's been an um, incredible author and writer. So here's her bio. Linda Weintraub is a curator, educator, artist, and author of several popular books about contemporary art. She has earned her reputation by making the outposts of vanguard art accessible to broad audiences. Weintraub's books explore exploring the contemporary art and ecology include What's Next? Eco-Materialism and Contemporary Art in 2018, To Life, Eco-Art in Pursuit of Sustainable Planet, 2012, I used that in my class uh, when I was teaching, and uh, event Guardians 2007, a series of textlets that include ecocentric topics, pioneering themes of eco art, psychological art, recycling matters for eco art, environmentalities. I might be pronouncing this wrong, but uh, please correct me, Linda, later on. 22 Approaches to Eco Art. Her forthcoming book is titled, Who Do You Eat? She is currently completing two texts, Beyond Death, Reflections on the Afterlife, Imagining the Unfathomable, Inscrutable, Unknowable, and Artistic Life, and, and Artistic License, Nature-Based Solutions, When Everything is Possible. Weintraub applies environmental concepts to, to her own art practice and to her personal life by managing a sustainable homestead where she practices permaculture. She served as the director of the ESC Bloom 
Art Institute located on the Bard campus, college campus, and was the Henry mm -hmm. Luce Professor of Emerging Arts at Oberlin College. So let's give a big welcome to Linda. Thank you. <laughs> no trumpets, what's going on? <laughs> ta -da, ta -da. Anyhow, uh, thank you all for tuning in. I'm really pleased to um, be part of this very prestigious organization and a distinguished series of speakers. Uh, and have to say, um, the invitation came along with a big contemplative challenge to consider how I would make a contribution to the series. Um, initially, I thought about plucking individual projects out of my history, but oh my gosh, my history is really long, and that was very confusing. So um, I'm going to start with just thinking about the word pedagogy, and then I'm going to present to you those projects that are currently being worked on uh, by me and their relationship to eco-art pedagogy. So I hope we can just dig right in, but I welcome your comments. Please don't save them or hesitate. Um, questions and cri criticisms and any observations are really welcome all along the way. So let's keep it loose and open and uh, in the form of a dialogue. So... First thing I did, because I do a lot of writing, is I thought about the word pedagogy, and I came up with two associated words uh, that really provide very unfortunate relationships to what I think we're all striving to accomplish. So uh, since you seem to all share my passion, you might find this is equally distressing. Um, related to pedagogy is the word pedantic. Pedantic means ostentatiously learned. A pedagogue is a dull teacher. And a pedant is one who is unimaginative. So I thought about these definitions and I've come to a bold conclusion. And that is when you are a pedagogue or involved with pedagogy through eco art, it is absolutely impossible to fall into any of those definitions. Um, why? Um, how could you be ostentatiously learned when you're dealing with a subject that is too complex to begin to consider the possibility of grasping it all, let alone being an expert in it all. So I don't think we have to worry about being pedantic. And then I was thinking about dull, no, unimaginative, no. I think the issue of eco art is so urgent, so timely, it is not possible to present this work in a dull manner. I think it's too new, still evolving. We haven't yet got it all congealed. And so every incursion into this area has got to be imaginative. Um, so I don't think we have to fear those negative associations with the word pedagogy. Um, that leaves us with a wide open field of possibility. So I have to say, uh, I got involved in eco art pedagogy almost 25 years ago. It remains for me a stimulating, challenging, professional commitment. Um, I um, so feel privileged to be a part of a movement and to have colleagues like those who are assembled here. Um, I acknowledge the fact, and maybe it's wonderful that there's been no academy um, that has congealed the right way to teach and the kind of material that would be appropriate for students to learn when they're being presented with eco art uh, opportunities. And um, 
there are just a myriad approaches and a zillion different kinds of content um, that will fit within this category. So um, we all share this thing. It's amorphous, it's evolving, it's dynamic, it's flexible, it's got loose joints, it can expand to accommodate any number of different kinds of uh, opportunities. So I think as contributors to this field, we have no alternative but to be creative ourselves and to be inventive and to take risks and to experiment and to face challenges. So I've made a list of the ways in which I'm currently engaging in eco-art pedagogy. Um, some of them are quirky, um, some of them may not delight you, but I hope in each case it kind of rounds out a very personal approach to uh, this exciting challenge um, that uh, I think is so urgent and uh, timely. So, eco art pedagogy as a curator, all right, I think it's not just in the classroom because the field is so evolving and so involving that however you enter the field, you're going to be an inventor as well. And once you're inventing and introducing something that is yet not congealed, I mean, there is a learning component to it. So the current project in which I am working as a curator is called Beyond Death. Um, it is going to be not an exhibition in the gallery setting, but an exhibition in a context of a journal. Um, it will appear in the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts publication, CSPA. Um, really excited by presenting a topic um, that is possibly controversial and hopefully provocative because um, it had occurred to me at my late date uh, in life um, and the fact that I have been managing animals that the whole system, cultural system of acknowledging death is very well developed in terms of anticipating death, in terms of burial practices, and in terms of grieving. But there is one component of this scenario that we seem to avoid, and that is what actually happens after we die? What about the materiality? of the corpse? How do we acknowledge that? What is the experience of being dead? Is there an experience of being dead? Is it timely now for us to confront a subject which has been avoided and kind of uncomfortable? So um, the topic was accepted by the editors of the journal and we decided that um, I would invite artists to contribute pages to the journal. And I decided why not invite really distinguished artists and as a principle that I've pursued as a curator for the last bunch of years, I will not simply go and pluck out existing artwork and somehow assemble it into a presentation because being a curator gives you the opportunity to encourage the creation of brand new work. And I don't think it's necessary for the artists to have ever worked in the subject before. So I imagined in my wildest dreams who might I really invite and encourage to contribute people who I think would be really worthwhile contributors. And so I aimed really high, expecting for two reasons that there would be defections. Um, one, 
artists are very busy. They're distracted. They're doing their own work. Um, don't bother me with anything brand new like this. And maybe they would simply recoil from the subject matter. So I invited more artists than I had been given permission to include in the journal. I think it is really significant that every artist I invited not only agreed, <laughs> I was just shocked. They agreed instantaneously and enthusiastically. So among the artists in this presentation, I'm including Linda Montano, Kathy High, Zhu Bing, uh, Emilia Rojas, Ben Altman. It's just a beautiful group of artists. Um, I love bringing people together who are very diverse, but they are unified by a common interest in a common format. Um, this encourages people to have a pedagogical experience. They can compare and they can contrast. It's not just a random assembly of uh, items, but there is a coherence there. So it activates the audience. I give them not just experiences, but I put the individual contributors in relation to each other. Uh, the artworks kind of have a dialogue. Um, all kinds of issues can be elicited in this way. And you see the range of different viewpoints and you can search for commonalities. And maybe most important of all, you can find within this group your own home base, some place that you would like to um, identify with. So there's a pedagogical principle that I apply to my curatorial work, um, which is always to assemble variety within a coherent and congealed kind of um, kind of setting. So I hope you'll see that the uh, results are really quite wonderful. Everyone was given a section in the journal, so you will uh, see an interview with me, and then they're given several pages to visualize their way of addressing this, uh, this issue, and uh, there is nice bio material as well. So eco-art pedagogy as a curator is one way that I've been really active for a long time. Um, another way I am conducting eco-art pedagogy is through workshops. And so I have been developing these workshops that I call Tune In, Turn On. Um, and uh, they... Um, are all designed as opportunities for participants to overcome the kind of alienation from the material world around us that has become so common in industrial, technologically, digitally oriented uh, societies that we all live in. So my hope is that through the workshops, people through their sensual bodies can then make a connection and reconnect with the materiality of their environment that seems to be suppressed by the lifestyles um, that are currently prevailing. So um, instead of cybernetic interactions instead of technologically mediated experiences, what I try to do in the workshops is reawaken physicality. So in each workshop, I kind of focus on some physical sensations, some particular sensory experience uh, so that we have a very intimate physical connection with something in the real world. So um, and let me describe the one I did most recently, if I may. Uh, I was uh, asked to do a workshop at a eco art 
Center that also is a permaculture center it was a delightful place. There were, um, I think, about 18 people assembled, ages 25-ish. Um, and we gathered for this potential. So every day, I was there for a week. Every day, we focused on a different somatic interaction. So I'm just going to describe one of them. And um, that was done by, I invited all the people to lie on the floor, face up. All the people's heads were toward the middle of a radiating circle and with their bodies and feet coming out from the center. And I placed in the hand of each person one ice cube. And I invited them to interact with the ice cube in their hand and to think about how their body was affecting the ice cube and how their body could affect the ice cube. And they imagined if they wanted to accelerate the melting of the ice cube, what could their body do to produce this result? And we talked about getting the engines going inside their body and breathing deeply or closing their hand and making it a warm environment for the ice cube or rubbing the ice cube to create friction, which creates heat. And to consider the fact that they are, even if they are not willfully jeopardizing the longevity of that ice cube just by existing. Their bodies are creating an environment that is going to endanger the duration in which that ice cube is going to exist. And so each person decided they want to speed up the melting of the ice cube make it linger a really long time. They focused really hard on how it changed as it was melting, how the edges rounded, how it gradually became liquid, how its weight was reduced, um, and how the first liquid ran out of their palm. And then the idea was to let it go, let the ice cube go with this energy exchange of their body uh, affecting it until the ice cube was completely melted. And at that point, their right hand that was holding the ice cube was very cold. And so they could then hold the left hand of the person who was beside them and just to hold hands as their energy was interspersed and traveled from one to the other until finally there was only the average temperature between them and a kind of homeostasis had returned from this disturbance that they ice cube had created and then we talked about the project and we talked about the fact that we as humans affect the environment whether we intend to or not we talked about vulnerability we talked about our relationships um, with the material world around us and um, we talked about the fact that life is warmth and warmth is the essence of health for some and for the ice cube, it is a jeopardy. And then we talked about the ice cube as a metaphor for the glaciers. And as an art experience, we might think of this energy exchange and the power to accelerate the melting of ice might 
metaphorically be significant in this time. So anybody got a comment now or shall I keep on going? You okay? Okay. Um, Mary, I don't think you're, um, I think you need to unmute. unmute. Um, we have one question from Christina. Where is this Eco Art and Permaculture Center? I do very little traveling. I'm really circumspect about that, but I am so convinced that Zoom doesn't do it. And we got to be in the same room. We have to breathe the same atmosphere and chair. So I relent and occasionally travel. And this wonderful place was in Portugal. And uh, I worked with uh, it is funded by the EU. Um, this uh, amazing program where the students who I worked with were given the opportunity, they came from all over Europe. Uh, they were given the opportunity to spend a year in this privileged situation. Uh, all expenses paid. I mean, can you imagine this happening in the US government funding it? Um, so their art supplies were paid for and their transportation was paid for and they had a little spending money on the side. And um, I'm very happy to report that they took the privilege seriously and I really hope that they develop over the years. So I was the very first experience they had in this very privileged uh, setting. Yeah. But I'm happy to give you information about it. I wish they took Americans as well as Europeans, but that's the one stipulation. What's it called? I'm sorry? What is it called? It's called Quintus del Relvas, R-E-L-V-A-S. Uh, drop me a note. I'll, I'll send you the material, okay? Yeah. Uh, um, the other thing that I learned when I was there is uh, about an organization that is being formulated and they're just getting ready to go in North America um, in which they're organizing organ small organizations scattered around um, who have some mission or capability in common with each other. So there is a network in Africa already established and a network in uh, Asia and one in Europe. And now they're going to start in the U.S. So send me the names of you have community groups or other kinds of organized ecology, art and science initiatives and I'll see if we can get us all together and form what's called GALA, G-A-L-A. And uh, we're excited about it. So those two things happened when I was there. Hmm. Go on. Yeah. Community outreach. Okay. I really committed as a member of a community, as an artist, as just belonging um i always try to have something happening that is oriented toward my local community so um the most recent one i did the one that appears on my calendar for the last few weeks was called not seeking salvation but seeking salivation sweet salty sour and the idea was to gather everybody together to focus on the sensations, the rich, varied, amazing opportunities that are given to us by our mouths to interact with the material stuff of the world. So the way it was organized is that I boiled up a load of rice and everybody got a bowl with rice and then they could go around and pick their own sauces and sprinkles and seasonings and preserves um, and mix and match and taste and share and, 
and uh, I imagine it is a great festival. We have a blindfold tasting station. Um, people were able to create works of art in which they expressed how each of the sweet, salty, sour seemed to manifest itself in terms of color and form. Um, and we have people going around taking photographs of folks as they tasted something very sour. Okay, and so I envision this as this great, joyful uh, way to honor our mouths, our tongues, our noses. And I have to say, in all honesty, after all these years and doing all of these events, this was not a successful endeavor. And I am still trying to figure out, and I um, tell you about this, both to reach out and ask, maybe you have uh, your own way of analyzing what didn't work. We had some people came, but very few. And it's those who came seemed to enjoy it, but those who didn't really, st they stayed away. Um, in the past, I've done other potlucks with the community, and they've been more than well attended. So this came as a real surprise. Um, but I tell you about it because I think it's really significant when it comes to eco-art pedagogy. Um, there is, seems to be no formula. There is no guarantee. Um, I'm gotten, and this is in the category maybe of a confession, I've gotten really sensitive to the fact that the backdrop within which eco-art is being made, and we're talking about easily 20, 25 years, culture has changed. The background culture has changed. And so I'm wondering whether even if something, an approach uh, or a topic might have been well received at one time, perhaps the cultural mood has shifted in such a way that it's no longer appealing. And so I'm reaching out to you, my buddies, my community, my colleagues, and to find out this was pretty significantly unsuccessful. And uh, I am getting nervous about continuing my volunteer efforts in the community uh, if what I'm going to provide is not going to be well received. So anybody got a thought? I really would welcome that. Um, I guess I have a question, Linda. What, um, when did this workshop or um, this uh, experience take place? I'm sorry, what was these, uh, what, when, when did it happen? Mm -hmm. The, the dates? Two weeks ago. Oh, two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it took place at a fabulous dynamic uh, eco science art institution that is young and vibrant and um, very unorganized organized so it's loose and it's willing to try all kinds of new things and uh, make a suggestion. Any of you, you want to come to the Ithaca area, <laughs> um, make a suggestion, you're likely to hear a resounding and enthusiastic yes. So, I mean, we've done all kinds of goofy things like um, overnights, you know, if we really want to get to know each other and have some art meaningful art experiences we shouldn't go home and get into our own beds so Linda, why don't we just keep out um, together um, Nolene has her hand raised good hello Linda I think it's interesting in what you're saying about lack of take-up and um, because in my course there are 38 students and I'm the only one that's working with eco art Hmm. And work, working with nature, um, the rest seem to be going the um, 
computerized way with computerized arts or performance art, but none that are really using ecology, nature, the environment, or the changes that are taking place with green energy and everything else. None of them are utilizing that or using that or even highlighting that in their art. Do you think that is an accurate reflection of how many artists are really integrating ecology into the work or might it have something to do with the artists who were accepted into the program? I mean, how was your interest made clear to the faculty when you applied? I did write a bit about um, how I work with nature to create art. Um, you know, like tree drawings and wind drawings and things like that. But that wasn't really a big part of it, uh, of my personal statement for admission. Um, but I'm I'm the granny of the group. I'm 63 and the rest are ages between 19, 20 and I would say 35. So I just wonder if it, the next generation just don't have an interest in it. I mean, they think I'm a bit wacky compared to them and my ideas are a bit wacky compared to theirs um, because my work is uh, my work and my thinking is completely different to what theirs is. Theirs is more, I would say, based on the individual than based on the community or the environment or earth, the world as a whole. All I can think of saying is that we've got a lot of work to do. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, there is such an urgent need for artistic creativity to contribute to what changes in society um, are being called for. And yeah, um, when I think about that, I think about two things in order to comfort you and myself. And that is like in an ecosystem, um, we campaign for newness and change and dynamics that we see reflected always usually in a dynamic ecosystem. But that system also needs homeostasis. It needs to be rooted in some kind of condition uh, that it can return to. So maybe the issue is the proportion of newness to convention um, that we can all perhaps nudge in the direction of invention. But one of the big problems that eco-pedagogues yeah, confront is that I'll bet most of us never were presented with ecology in our classes when we were students. And so if we're going to do that now, we have to invent a method, a strategy, the content, start without a precedent. Um, and so it's not an easy thing to do, which is why I wrote what I think is the first eco art textbook, because my goal in doing that, this is now several years ago, so it doesn't appear on my current agenda here, but I have the book. Where is it? Linda, it is. when you're done, Abigail has her hand up too. But anyhow, this is, as far as I know, the first eco art textbook. And I wrote it because I'm so concerned that teachers will find the task, even those who want to include it, find the task of deciding what material and how to present it so daunting that they may be discouraged. So I thought, oh, let me assemble things, organize it, give them within the content of the book, lots and lots of freedom, elbow room. Gosh, should I talk about this for a minute? So I wanted to write a textbook in the spirit of ecosystems. So 
Can you see? Mm -hmm. So these are diagrams that are speckled throughout. Lift it up a little bit. There you go. There. So let me look this one. Um, different approaches to eco art. So rather than being doctrinaire, I have chosen about 30 different artists, and then they are given presentations within relevant categories. So, hold on one second. So in this case, I ask um, what approach to ecology is the artist taking? And I have as a list conservation, preservation, social ecology, deep ecology, restoration ecology, urban ecology. You got it? So that people, teachers, and other users of the book can pick and choose what is of interest. Here is another one. So the same artists appear again, but this time they're analyzed according to ecological issues. And so all the artists who are dealing with energy are identified. Those dealing with waste, with climate change, with technology, with habitat. So every reader can pick and choose every artist who is a practicing artist and every teacher can pick and choose the topics, those artists who are engaging in that way and create their own narrative. Um, so essentially what I wanted to do with this book is structure the book the way ecosystems function with the interconnections and the linkages and the cross energy exchanges and the dynamism and the fact that it's loose and exciting and can be formulated in a thousand different manners. Linda, Abigail has her hand up. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to respond to uh, what I felt about your sadness about the community not uh, celebrating your taste ex taste art experience um and first off that um maybe you're it's too avant-garde for them they're not ready but also maybe you could go bigger with it like next one could be on sound and it would be really interesting can they accept sound in eco art or touch you know you go through the five senses or and and then the community could say well why did why why was this different with taste the other thing is that um just i don't know about your community but my community for the past month since um october 7th has been somewhat dissociated so to be in the body at this moment could really be very difficult for people and um and you know if it was two weeks ago i there was so much vibration in in the world so that could also have interfered with something so personal and so holding so much memory because taste also holds tradition and family and it's a epigenetic experience. So may I ask, do you think it's more the coincidence of the timing or do you think it's more the fact that the community simply found this weird and was not prepared to contribute. Well, I think it might. I don't know if you were able to ask some community members. They, you know, the, if if there was any um, response afterwards or anything, or if you know some people who were there, and there could just be, a, you know, kind of they could give you some feedback on 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 what it was that feedback I was getting. Just I don't know, like people. But were they going to have to share food and sharing food is unhealthy and strange things like that, that I have to admit never occurred to me. Um, but, yeah. it's, you know, um, the reason I was confident is because past 
community potlucks that I've organized have just been wonderful. And so this came as a real shock. And I think the timing with presenting this material to you is perfect. Yeah. Because um, it just shows us, you know, we have to continually be sensitive, I guess, to the moment and the conditions, uh, anticipate what is the right time and what isn't. I think perhaps I wasn't sensitive enough in this one. I don't think we could have anticipated this. It, this, it, yeah. yeah, it sounded like a beautiful experience. I'd love to have been there. <laughs> Well, do it and let me know how yours goes because it was, you know, it was really everything was in order and ready to go for the crowds. Um, Abigail, somebody said they had a that was question. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. Anybody else? How did it work? How did it work for the people who were actually there? Yeah, well, well, then, then it was successful. <laughs> so somebody who, um, I have to admit, I poured my little heart out too, said, but it's the quality of the experience everybody has. And the people who were here had a great time. So I have to say the leftovers are dinner tonight. I have some lovely sauces that are, are lingering. But okay, so how about this one? Uh, another category of eco-art pedagogy. Um, Maybe I'll start by telling you a little anecdote to prepare you for this. And uh, so a couple of years ago, <clears throat> my husband and I moved to this new area and we started life again. Um, we left the active homestead um, that we had been operating, God, for what, 20 years before then. And um, the way I started homesteading um, is a story that might resonate with all of you as well. Um, one thing that distinguishes my marriage is that my husband and I have now designed and built eight houses. Um, they have all been experimental and we have design them to honor different phases in our lives, particularly as the children matured. So the last house was grandma, grandpa house, and we had to have animals. We had to have garden. I mean, the perfect grandma, grandpa um, can't provide the perfect experience for grandkids without all of these kinds of this setting. Um, but we were very vague um, about our intentions when we kind of undertook this project. So basically we're looking around without a clear vision of what was our next project. And um, we discovered 11 acres that I just fell in love with. It was literally love at first sight. There was an energy coming from that land that was so hospitable, so welcoming, that I decided somehow or other, this is going to have to somehow become our new home. Um, and so it was at this time that I made the acquaintance of an artist. And I was telling him, he was in California, I was in New York, um, about this discovery. And he said, well, tell me, well, you know, tell me about the land, the 11 acres. Um, he happens to be an artist who works very closely with the land and knows land management really well. And so I said, oh my goodness, it's got a view over the distant mountains and the sun will set over the mountains every night and there's a meadow and a stream and beautiful trees and I remember taking a deep breath at the end of this description and saying it's so beautiful and what I got on the other end of the phone was silence I didn't hear a thing for the longest time, there was this tension and this long silence, and I didn't know what was going to come. It was like I offended him. I didn't know what had happened. And finally, he said, hmm, 
Is that all it is? Is it just beautiful? And we hung up. And that started my whole changed relationship with my land. I went on a pursuit trying to figure out, because at that point I had no idea, why do you have land for a house? Well, hopefully it's beautiful. What else could it be? So as I explored alternatives to it just being beautiful, I developed a whole elaborate practice of homesteading where we of course had the garden and the orchard and the berry patch and we also had chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys and rabbits and pig and lamb and bees and did maple syrup and you get the idea it was a full-scale wonderful operation just loved doing it um, then for various reasons, we had to move. So we are now starting again. And um, it has been a pedagogical challenge to do this reconditioning all over again. Um, because we have a really bulky piece of land, it is not welcoming. It was not beautiful when we got it. Um, bought it for all kinds of reasons. Um, and um, so little by little, ironically, I've been trying to introduce beauty to this unseemly piece of land. Um, it was originally literally a dump with tires and mattresses and rusting trucks and refrigerators strewn all over. We couldn't even see the land for the first year or so that we owned it. Um, and now I'm beautifying. So I'm beautifying in a way where it's like waltzing with a new partner you've never danced with before. You just don't understand its rhythm and its constitution and what it wants uh and so i feel like though i knew about animals i knew about wildlife i knew my land i knew my trees uh in the other place here it's all strange and i have to start all over again eco art pedagogy my art is taking care of the land and pedagogy is self-pedagogy. I have to learn how to do this all over again with soil that I've never known before, rocks that I have never interacted with before, wild plants, uh, invasives galore, I don't know what to do with. So there's a new aspect to this pedagogy, which is very personal and very all-encompassing. So I tell you this because in the trunk of my Subaru Crosstech right this moment, I, I have a bunch of rocks that I was able to gather from a neighbor who's a farmer who re removes the stone from his, from his uh, agricultural fields. And I am using that stone as an art element to create terracing that will become beds where I'll be able to create fertility, hopefully, where there is not much where I am, and begin to grow things. I made a fire pit, which will be hopefully a community gathering place. Uh, pathways are stone laid one by one by me. Um, it is really uh, an involving and um, frankly difficult situation because I was so in tune with the homestead that we left and trying to redevelop uh, that attunement with this one. So the big challenge of eco-art pedagogy is how do you make habitat? How do you increase the biodiversity? 
how do you provide conditions on a piece of land in which wildlife will thrive, be attracted, and um, inform this land with their energy and give you a kind of a connection. Um, is that a... So... Um, I was reminded of the difference between the homestead and the new place. Um, and I came across something I had written a couple of years ago when we were still at the old place. Um, I was asked to contribute an essay for a publication on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. And I got the invitation, I wrote back immediately and I said, thank you for the invitation, but I have never been to wilderness, not once in my life. I don't know wilderness. I know woods. I know some forests. No wilderness. I don't know what to do. Um, and they insisted uh, that I write. I went out. I had this amazing experience. It was uplifting in every way. And guess what? I just didn't know how to convey anything but my real honest reaction. And so I wrote a piece and it's called Homesick in the Wilderness because what I missed was the intimate connection with land that I had and you are alien to the setting in a wilderness. So I'm looking at the clock and I have so much more to share with you. Um, will my host please guide us? What shall I do? Um, okay. Uh, you know what we could, what we could do is stop for a moment, stop this recording because some people have had to go and then we'll just keep going. How about that? If that's okay with you all, yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. I think what we'll do is thank everybody who came um, right now, but we're not finished. We're just going to stop this recording so people have an hour recording if they want it, and then we'll continue right away. So all we need to do is just stop the recording here. Thank you very much, Linda. And then we'll go ahead.